right, so this is Mike Rogers, Rogers the channel, and uh, just going to start my pilgrimage through some of the favourite programmes and films of my youth up to the present day and whenever. And today I'm going to do the Five Doctors. Of course, all the Doctor Who fans do this one, but why should I be original anyway? Why should I just cop? Why shouldn't I just copy everyone else and just do this? I think we'll look at the five doctors together. So I've got the DVD in. This is the televised version, the transmitted version, not the special edition. Because, like I say, this is a pilgrimage through my past and and childhood and favourite moments throughout. So we're not going to watch the special edition. We're going to watch the edition I saw on the telly. So get your DVD in of the transmitted transmitted version, the one they showed on the telly. Uh, get yourself up to the play, and we will play in three, two, one, play. Here we go. And here's Mr. Hartnell. Yes, I didn't have a clue who this was at the time. Sort of browny, this, isn't it? It's not like the original black and white. I know the DVDs have been remastered, but but yeah, I remember being massively excited about this at the time. I didn't realise he was the Doctor. I don't think then. Because it's the end of Dalek Invasion of Earth, and here he goes. Now, my confession, of course, is that this is my favourite Doctor Who, the Fifth Doctor. Um, I was uh, born in '74, so that he would have come around. I would have been seven or eight when he was a Doctor, moving up to ten. And uh, to be honest, I was always a bit scared by. Tom Baker's Doctor, and I think my earliest memory of Doctor Who is Destiny of the Daleks, he must have been, and the shaking of the screen, where Roman and the Daleks come out, and I remember seeing Tom Baker, and he, he just scared me for some reason, I always found Tom Baker intimidating and scary as a kid, so when Peter Davison came along, I thought, oh yeah, this is marvellous, he's a lovely chap, so kind, and everyone moans about, there he is, there, dusting off the, the new console, which everyone will know about, of course. Uh, this is the new console for the new, uh, the rest of the series, really, the rest of the classic series, until they threw it in the bin, I think, at some point, in the McCoy era, which is probably best what happened to it, really, because McCoy's era is not great, is it? But here he is, my doctor, Peter Davison, wonderful chap. Uh, you know, they all moan about the outfit, but I love the cricket stuff, me, I think this is marvellous. I used to have a sort of long coat that I would put on because it was creamy colour it looked a bit like that and you know you'd play act the doctor and everything and I would uh, pretend to be Peter Davison whereas my friend from down the road would pretend to be Tom Baker or those more popular 70s doctors of Pertwee and um, Baker, Tom Baker uh, here we are this is obviously this is Wales which is looks fairly pretty I suppose doesn't it and P. Davison always looking prim and proper, of course. Just read his autobiography, quite an interesting read. I think he should have gone a bit more in-depth into his life, but it was all right. I quite enjoyed it. Didn't realise he came from a sort of mixed background. It was lovely, yeah. Mark Strickson as Turlo had to dye his hair ginger because uh, in a long shot, with he, he really had blonde hair, not ginger hair, so in long shots he looked too much like Peter Davison, apparently. So... Um, he had to have his hair dyed ginger and he said he's, he spent the two years he was in Doctor Who with red dye you know coming off onto his pillow and stuff <laughs> but yeah this this was shown on uh, Comic Relief um, 1983 I think yeah something like that and um, it was just fantastic at the time I mean I really I was into Doctor Who at this time I think um, I used to it used to be on like a Tuesday or something, and uh, I I think my dad the uh, chip van used to come up where I used to live outside the house, and we get sauce, jumbo sausage and chips, and uh, I think Rolf Harris's cartoon time would come on, which of course is now a pariah. Is the Willie Hartnell, but well, we'll talk about him in a bit, we've got plenty of time. But yes, of course, Ralph Harris's cartoon, we'd sit there and he'd draw a picture of a cartoon, you'd guess it, and then he'd show a cartoon. And Yeah, I mean, it was all right. I mean, I know he's now, you know, a completely disgusting human being who shouldn't be mentioned, but of course he's part of my memory, so that's why I mention. 
and then they would show Doctor Who after that or pretty close to it and uh, I would watch um, I think the earliest I saw Castro Velva which is the first fifth Doctor story um, and I remember bits of Kinder and uh, Earthshock is definitely in my memory big because of Adric going but then no one ever liked Adric and I didn't either so <laughs> um, oh look here we go there's all the pieces wouldn't you just love to have some of these pieces I would have loved to have had those pieces and another unit headquarters so uh, here's the brig uh, met him a few times he's a lovely well he was a lovely fella died a few years about now the guy standing next to him playing Colonel Crichton or whatever was in the war games he played um, the captain who helped Patrick Troughton out and I think he was in Claws of Axos as well because I've got a mad scientist type but never seen him anything else I think his name's something uh, David Savile or something like that but he was good in the war games and he pretty much wore the same outfit I think <laughs> they probably dug it back out <laughs> but here comes Troughton now uh, when I watched this originally back in 83 uh, I sort of knew about the other daughter which is you know the regeneration thing was the main fascinating part for me I found it really fascinating all the regeneration and stuff so the five faces of Doctor Who that they showed back then was uh, I think it was on BBC 2 and they showed a story from each Doctor um, John Levine refused to play in this so he didn't turn up, you know, like he was ever famous enough to ignore it. <laughs> Which is really weird, because, I mean, I've heard John Levine now, and he seems like he's really gone mad lately, these days. With all his talk of him being the sort of, he thought he was a star, and he's talking about Nicholas Courtney ruining him and John and Katie Manning's timing and everything, so he's definitely gone loopy, old John Levine, so we're glad he wasn't really in it, so he missed it. Because he played quite a big part in The Three Doctors. The Three Doctors is nowhere near as good as this. This is far better than The Three Doctors. Um, yeah, Patrick Troughton. Um, a good Doctor, but of course a lot of his stuff missing. Um, I mean, they recovered some of it. Uh, my favourite Troughtons are probably the War Games. Um... I like the Tomb of the Sidemen, that's definitely my second favourite, maybe even the first. Um, I like, because uh, they've now rediscovered the Web of Fear, that's brilliant. love the Web of Fear. Just another one of my top ones of Troughton's time. But yeah, he was a really good Doctor Troughton, obviously they lost a lot of his stuff, but now they've recovered enough, so that I like the Mind Robber. Mind Robber's all fancy weird, and that was very good as well, but he looks... He looks okay, but his hair is obviously wrong because he forgot to, because um, they'd lift it. I mean, he had more of a sort of Beatles mop top in the 60s, and uh, he grew it to the right length and everything, but he forgot to use the lifts and everything to make it look as he did. So he looks a bit flat. It looks like he's sort of sitting on his head like a dead God knows, you know. Um, doing the same run. He's missing a lung at this point, apparently. Lost one in the 60s, I think. Yeah. <laughs> um yeah so sort of running around before Peter Davison came on they did the five faces of Doctor Who and they showed an unearthly child which I vaguely remember uh, found that boring uh, then they showed the Crotons which I found fascinating for some reason uh, mysterious I love black and white I still love black and white um, then they showed Carnival of Monsters, which I don't remember at all. Uh, everyone raves, but I'm not mad keen on Carnival Monsters, to be honest. Three Doctors, which is fine. Logopolis, which I do remember seeing Tom fall and turn into Peter Davison, which I found magical at the time. I thought it was fascinating that that regeneration is probably my favourite. Here comes Mr. Pertwee in Bessie, in his Who one. Um, yeah. Uh don't mind I mean Pertwee he's sort of the anti he's an antithesis of the Doctor isn't he really he's an establishment figure I, mean, I, quite, I think he's quite elegant I think he's a good actor um, brilliantly funny chap you know funny guy never got the chance to meet him because I didn't really get into the whole um, convention thing till after he died in the 90s uh, me and my mate used to go to 
And there's this, see I much prefer, I don't like the Swirly Casper thing that picks them up in the rejigged edition of this, the special edition. I much prefer the black triangle, I think it's much better and an area. And the back to Peter Davison here, who's having bits of himself taken away. <laughs> Which is great, apparently they had to refilm this or something because the bits of it were faulty. But they're in Wales somewhere and it looks quite nice, the Isle of Ryan looks very nice, like Earth after a thunderstorm, yeah. Yeah, I do like it. It's pretty the TARDIS, which I always found fascinating. See, that was the two fascinating things for Doctor Who for me. It was obviously the regeneration and the TARDIS, which I thought was brilliant. The way it could go backwards and forwards in time, and it was bigger on the inside. And I think this was the first... The Five Doctors is the first one I really remember properly. Here comes Sarah Jane. Yeah, didn't really know who this was at the time. Canine's fun. They don't, weren't going to have him, but you got out because uh, John Nathan Turner didn't like Canine, but John Nathan Turner was a. Uh, I mean, he, they say, yeah, all kudos to him for keeping the program going, but the way it ended up, it would have been better off finishing after Peter Davison, I think. And Colin Baker and Sylvester McCoy being pretty much the two worst doctors of all. Um. And yeah, K9's fun, I like K9, I think he looks futuristic enough, even though he looks like a bot. Oh yeah, no, he looks fine. He's cute, isn't he? That's the idea, with his tartan thing. Sarah Jane, who, uh, although an attractive woman, never really did anything for me, wearing a nice raincoat and Victor, whatever the bloody hell that is she's wearing. Uh, looks like she's going to go for a swim, did not it? going to jump straight in that river. <laughs> um... Beware of the dog, yeah, where it's just coming up. And the old 80s writing that was all famous at the time. And here we are, here's our great loss to the story, which didn't bother me at all, because I wasn't keen on Tom Baker at the time. The, this, I thought, would have been made especially for this, to be honest. I, I wouldn't have known any better. It looked like it was It was never... This is from Sharda, of course, but it was never televised, so it could, it could be perfect. And I quite like this. I didn't know who Romana was at the time. Um, the, and uh, Tom looks good there, actually, doing the punting. Uh, he looks like he knows what he's doing. And, of course, I heard he was a bit of an arse, but, but yeah, he's full of vigour, full of life. And in season 18, he started to look rough and old. And But, you know, look here. I mean, he looks prime, doesn't he, really? Perfect health, happy. It's a shame it all messed up for him really in that last season when everyone wanted to change everything and then got rid of him. But it's brilliant. I love this. This is perfect for him really. I mean, he doesn't really need to be in the story. I mean, he would have overshadowed it, wouldn't he, if he'd have been in it. He would have been the main. I mean, he, Peter Davison was obviously the lead at this time, but if Tom Baker would have been in it, his part would have been massive. I, would, I think he would have insisted on it. He would have taken control of that. That's probably why he wasn't in it. He probably didn't want to be second rate to any other actor playing Doctor. I know he didn't like Pertwee and vice versa. Because they hold that middle ground of the most popular time of the classic series. You know, in the 70s, 70 through 80 is the most, you know, the the best time of Doctor. There he goes. Bye bye, Tom. And the biggest part of Peter's going, so he's going to die now or drop dead. Yeah, well, I love this. The cricket outfit, I think, is brilliant. I, I don't know why they moan about it. I think he looks perfect for this Doctor. Youthful. Even um, Hartnell's widow said uh, Davison looked like a young version of his husband. Of her husband, sorry. So, brilliant casting, really, if, if, that's, so, if that's true. And, of course, Davison, although, t to me, people don't say it, but I always think that Peter Davison's most like um, Troughton, really. I mean, he might look more like a young Hartnell, but I know he's got a sort of temper sometimes, but I think he acts more like Troughton, really. And Troughton and Davison were probably the best technical actors who played classic Doctors. You've got to say that, really, haven't you? They were the two. I mean, Davison and Troughton were both. This didn't damage their careers playing the Doctor. I managed to get past it and move on to our millions of other parts and I mean Trout died in eighty seven but he he was he was you know, both of these actors were great actors and they played the part. I mean Tom Baker and John Pert were basically playing 
versions of themselves um, basically themselves writ large same with Hartnell probably I mean he was a grumpy old git and you know so basically playing himself but Troughton apparently totally different to his portrayal of the Doctor and Peter Davison here I mean he's much lighter I think in real life and can sort of send himself up doesn't take himself too serious doesn't seem to and uh, this is a sort of because uh, he played Tristan in um, All Creatures Great and Small it's similar but sort of more Siegfried-y who was like the brother in that so if you combine sort of no I suppose he, yeah if you said he's playing sort of like a Siegfried really that's what he should have should have been told when he was taken on the way he just played it like that because uh, that would have been a much better sort of but then I think his Doctor's great he's whimsical he's young which is great the youngest Doctor of the classic Doctors if we go classic up to seven he is obviously the youngest and a better actor than Colin Baker and Sylvester McCoy by about 20 miles um, here we are on Gallifrey wearing the uh, obviously Gallifrey we went back to a bit too much and it looks I don't think it looks too bad it looks 80s obviously but then everything does it all reflects its time doesn't it uh, never saw I did mind the the Castellan here the lead he was quite funny Bruce was all right he's stirred up I think this guy was in a few hammer horrors I think he was in one with um, Trout and it might have been you know Scars of Dracula they might have been in the same one I don't know it doesn't really matter does it but he's stirred enough he's the first Bruce I saw obviously not the best but the first Bruce I saw obviously the best Bruce is um, Deadly Assassin you know there's, there's no doubt about that Whereas the Deadly Assassin is the best Gallifrey story, the best master, probably one of the best master stories. Uh, yeah. Um, here's the master in his second sort of, inc well, his second bodily incarnation as Anthony Ainley. And he was the master for me. I mean, I didn't know Delgado at the time. I'd seen him against Davison a few times. I'd seen him in Legopolis the last Baker, Tom Baker story and uh, the penguin suit never bothered me I thought he looks alright in this suit I think it looks quite regal I don't think it's black because he's a villain it's got a nice sort of rough thing on the side I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it apparently see this is a wig and a, a fake beard but it doesn't look too bad to me the, the hair doesn't look too bad it doesn't look like a massive wig to me I mean it looks quite good I think but you know here we are with our copy of the first Doctor, Richard Herndal, who John Nathan Turner saw on Blake 7 in a nappy, <laughs> playing a slave, looking similar, wearing the same wig, I think. And he said, even though he doesn't really look that much, he didn't. I didn't even notice it when I watched it. The first Doctor at the start looked the same as this to me. And he plays it all right. You know, it's fine. You know, the first Doctor's pretty much forgotten now. I know that sounds like blasphemy, but then I've never been mad keen on the first Doctor. He seems like, uh, you say he's the original and the best, but he's not. The first real Doctor was the second Doctor, I suppose. The character of the second Doctor is the one that sort of runs through all the Doctors, you know. Uh, except for Pertwee, probably, who's more like the first Doctor, but all the doctors pretty much uh, second the fourth doctor's a lot like the second doctor the fifth doctor I think has got lots of elements of the second doctor the sixth doctor although he said he played Eli Hartnell was just an annoying prick basically who no one liked and the seventh doctor was obviously a inverse copy of the second doctor really it's just another second doctor as far as I'm concerned um, and in the new series, um, I suppose, yeah, Matt Smith is basically a carbon copy, and and even Tennant's pretty similar to this. They, they all, yeah. And when you go away from that version of the Doctor, it it becomes worse. So that second Doctor is basically the main, as far as I'm concerned, he's the main uh, outline for the Doctor. That's his best version. 
second doctor, fourth doctor, fifth doctor, um, Tennant and Smith. Because I'm not keen on Capaldi, um, although he's a sort of mixture. They always do, they ruin it. Every time they try to make the doctor grumpy, older, um, it never works. I don't know why they bother. I know you've got to contrast it in some way. But then Tennant and Smith were similar and they worked brilliantly, I think. Um, so I could never see it. I mean, Eccleston, I suppose, he stands on his own, but we'll get into that if I ever do a sort of commentary for the latest stuff. But we've got to get through my youthful loves first. But this, this at the time, I thought was brilliant. I, I've, I recorded this on my dad's VHS. I think I kept the... the uh, they repeated it in parts the next year or something and I recorded it again and uh, I kept it for ages because it's by far my favourite story probably of the classic series to be honest uh, Peter Davison laying about but then never bothered me because I always found it always seemed to work really I always thought it worked for me really this Fifth Doctor stuff and uh Apparently, Peter Davison said he was going to have highlights in his hair to make it blonder. Susan's here, a bit of a weird continuity. They, they, they're probably better recasting Susan, to be honest, because the actress is a lot older, obviously, and she was deserted on Earth anyway back in the uh, 60s. So, I always wonder whether it was a Dalek, of course. Never my favourite baddies. Um, they're all right, but they didn't really scare me that much. I, um, I always thought the Cybermen were better. Um, uh, yeah, the Cybermen are a lot better, especially in the eighties. But then, everyone moans about Revenge of the Cybermen, and I think Revenge of the Cybermen's really good. I think it's got some funny dialogue. It's a nice little story. It never bothered me, and people moan about it all the time. It looks quite good. It's well made. It, the dialogue's good. If it, if you watch it and it doesn't bother you and you don't think about it too much, then and it's a good romp, then what's wrong? It's like this: it's a good romp, and people moan about continuity forever. But who cares? God, who cares? Have fun. I like this. This Dalek thing in the cage. This is brilliant. Yeah. I wonder what it was at the time, and I think that's. I think that's good. I really like that. I think that's like one of the first times we'd seen this the actual Dalek in the case. I mean, it's in the green things in Genesis of the Daleks, but not quite like that. That's really good. And we're at the Dark Tower because they thought they were on Scaro. And the director of this is Peter Moffat, who I think he does a good job of this one. Uh, he didn't do a very good job of the others he did, really, except for maybe State of Decay, which he did all right. But... Um, here they are and of course if B Tom Baker was in this I think the Brigadier would have been with Pertwee because obviously Pertwee spent most of his time with the Brigadier the Brigadier this is the first Doctor the Brigadier met and here they are the side men because Eric Sayward who's the script editor at this time he really loves this but then look I thought this was brilliant because I always thought they were obviously as a kid I thought these were robots and coming just on the back of um, Earthshock, they were brilliant Cybermen, I thought. Uh, Bessie. See, this is just brilliant stuff, isn't it? I mean, kids, especially in the 80s, this was brilliant. Just a wonderful little romp. They've got the old fog machine going hard. But Pertwee apparently was forever in makeup and getting his hair done and all this. And, and here goes Sarah Jane falling down the side. <laughs> She's a bit eighties on the hair front. It's got a bit large, hasn't it? But again, I I quite like this. I don't mind Pertwee's action because he obviously he's the sort of they call him the Bond of the Who's. He's the sort of grumpy Who who um obviously a sort of first Doctor type thing. Uh, he's definitely the most um, establishment Doctor. He is the establishment doctor. But he's pulling her out off this little incline. See, the direction is bad here because they could have done this and made it look a lot steeper. 
I should have probably got Barry Letts back to direct this. But I don't think John Nathan Turner would have let him anywhere near it, to be honest, because um, he executive produced Nathan Turner's first year, season 18. And uh, I don't think Nathan Turner liked the control, and he wouldn't have. But Letts was a good director. He would have done this better than Moffat, I would have thought. And Pertwee wearing all his proper gear, looking older, but he's still got the Pertwee thing going on. It's still fine. And she knows he regenerated, but he doesn't, so how does he... This is the line he stole, eh? <laughs> uh, I like this, but teeth and curls. Uh, see, Sarah Jane says she really did like Pertwee, and I suppose he was all right. He must have been good to work with, because apparently he was quite fun, but... He seems to take himself a bit too seriously and for a comedic actor. Doesn't seem right to me. I mean, yeah, but no. Nah. I like Perpy's Doctor, but he's not my favourite. And here's the old worn out first Doctor, the youngest of all the Doctors, eh? <laughs> um, look, I like this. this. This, I believed all this. I thought this was good. This looks like an alien planet to me. Um, the TARDIS is right there. Why didn't they see that three seconds ago? It's right in front of them. And obviously they're going to go inside, but doesn't it look any different to them? Where's their TARDIS? Oh, they've been scooped, haven't they? I forgot. And um, they're off into the TARDIS now. Here they are. Lovely. Back to the... Uh, and just because he looks older he's got a lot less experience so he should defer to the fifth doctor he should listen to the fifth doctor the fifth doctor is a lot older and a lot wiser so something they don't quite grasp isn't it because he looks young he's obviously young but no see he calls him young man but he should know he's he know, should know he's a regeneration that's what happens in regeneration isn't it stupid uh, but Herndall's all right. I mean, he doesn't look like Hartnell, but he's very good. I think he died not long. I don't even think he saw it. He got his fee and died um, about two months after, I think. But well, okay, at the time, I didn't have a clue. I, he was the first Doctor to me. I hadn't seen a lot of the first Doctor, so like Tegan used to fancy Tegan a bit. I think she, you know, very nice. Never fancied Susan, she looks, no, too mumsy. But Tegan, yeah, feisty Australian, but nice little shape. Uh, good looking woman, nice hair. Bit serverland, Blake Seven, you know. Although I came to Blake Seven later, so I might even do one of them at some point as a part of my chronology. <laughs> um, and here she is saying, because it's all sexist, isn't it? Which is true, they, she shouldn't have to go make the tea, it's this is like the early this is like 83 so still the sexist BBC sexist script writers and Terence Dix who wrote this suffers from this he's quite a sexist guy which is a shame for quite you know he's an intelligent man but the the companion should be tied to the railways he's always going on about why you know yeah why can't the doctor be tied to them? the companion I mean I don't see the difference why, why not but no Terence Dix no the female cipher so he's obviously a sexist which is a, I suppose he's a product of his era but we're supposed to learn aren't we as we live on never mind here's the master getting his uh, bell from his uh, bike <laughs> being put into the uh, death zone whatever he's blooming called yeah it's the same as the TARDIS and all that the disappearing thing Dina Sheridan here playing Thalia whether she was in I like the film, it's uh, where they drive the old fashioned cars to Brighton or something. Um, quite enjoyed that. This is quite good, I mean that looks like it's there, didn't it, the tower? It doesn't look fake. It sits alright. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> if uh, the Doctor's a Time Lord Rebel, then why is it a shame? He shouldn't care, he should have thrown all this history away, shouldn't he, really? <clears throat> The Brig, who asked for a hairpiece because he was vain after Mordred undead. Mm. I mean, this is just all I know now, but apparently this is the first time he grew the tash. 
but even in the old ones, I didn't realise it was a fake dash, but you can't see it's a rug he's got on his head, can you? It's not too, although the whole thing looks like a wig, to be honest. <laughs> um, um, but they look freezing cold, didn't they? Puffing out the cold smoke, uh, breath and all that. And Here's Ainley, apparently a massive physical coward. Great cricket player or something. Had a private income, so... Oh, there they go, the laser beams. I don't know, they did revamp all these, but I, was, I don't care, I don't need all that. It's never been about the visuals for me, really, Doctor. It's always been about the stories, and I found the stories fascinating. Throughout the classic era, up to really the Sixth Doctor. I mean, there's some real clunkers in the Fifth Doctor. There's clunkers in all of the eras of Doctor Who. I mean the third doctor I mean colony in space and the mutants the most boring oh good for say good if you insomniac and want some sleep bun colony of space on or the mutants and you'll zonk right out because it's boring as god it's really boring two doctors working together in the TARDIS we like it here's Bessie this is good as well yeah we like this you know it's lucky they've roads in the death zone really didn't know time lords had cars but why not who cares it looks really good and i think i think pervy is good he's got a sort of strength hasn't he um of character but um janet field who plays egan said he was a medallion man <laughs> which i suppose he does look a bit like and, and because uh Katie Manning said he was looking a bit bald. His hair got humongous, apparently, because, you know, he's obviously a really vain guy. You know, we're all vain, but he was massively vain. The Dark Tower, there he is, eh? <laughs> cool again. I just remember being so excited. I think I even put on me... I, I, I used to love wearing a cricket jumper, you know. <laughs> the Fifth Doctor was definitely my Doctor. Uh, and uh, I know Tom Baker is the best doctor of all possibly but Peter Davis is my favourite uh, they bought the old codgers number plate for who won <laughs> oh here he is uh, this is meeting between so time lords recognise each other but Pertwee doesn't recognise him straight away does he even though he he um, probably did the most master stories um the good i mean roger delgado is obviously the definitive master of the classic era even though i came to that later so this is really my master he looks the similar he's got the same look about him as the original master but delgado was a lot better uh, uh, he was good i mean terror of the orton's is his first story and i like that that's a classic um uh, some of his abort, I think he was in Colony in Space, so that's boring. Uh, Frontier in Space is quite boring, it's alright. A lot of six parters in the Pertwee era, which tends to drag. Especially Monster of Peladon, which must be probably the worst. Although, I suppose I could watch that more than I could watch Colony in Space, because every time I watch Colony in Space, it's like grey and boring. That I can't get past the second episode, I don't think. <laughs> this is good, though. And, uh, yeah, I just remember this wrapped me when I was young. I used to sit there and... and it was comic, it was an early comic relief because I'd only just started and Terry Wogan, I think, introduced it all. But it was good because he was like an hour and a half, I think, and it was in the middle of the Friday night and it was boring, wasn't it, to watch... Um, Children and Eve was boring to watch because they'd always put the, you know, always have the, st that's definitely not Anthony Ailey running off there. You can see that's a stunt man. Uh, no, they'd always, like, have stars on there begging you for money. And, of course, I was young, but my mum and dad would work hard and these stars would give them bugger all except their time. And I just found that one massive con myself, you know. Why should, like, the, the people who work a normal job give their little bit when all these stars are just giving time and not doing nothing mm. yeah didn't like that there they are that's another shard of picture it was all wibbly wobbly um yeah this is all good not much happening 
You know why Tom Baker wouldn't have been in it? He, well, he hadn't left long and he would have been wanting to be central to it. And uh, I don't think he was mad keen on Nathan, obviously because he got fired, well, not fired, but not renewed. <laughs> Tom Baker wasn't renewed, was he, for nine? Because I think he would have gone on until he was dead, I think, although he's still alive at the time of recording, which is 19th of May 2017. But yes, this is brilliant, and see that looks alright, doesn't it? It doesn't look too bad if it's glassed on, whatever, it still looks alright. Yeah, keyed in, whatever. Uh, and of course, Trowan's wearing his Yeti coat, because the Yeti were, pro you know, they all remember fondly the uh, Abominable Snowman. I listen, it's lost story, I listened to the audio, but it was a bit crap. Boring, really. Uh, I think they filmed, probably filmed it here actually, <laughs> in the mountains of Wales, it's probably the same bloody location. But um, the Brig had lost his memory and Mordred undead and all that, so it's funny, uh, they're, 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 even though I didn't know these characters when I was young, they all seemed familiar in a way, it was weird. Oh, there they go, BBC Model B Graphics. <laughs> we had BBC Basic Computers at school. And uh, that was about as good as it got, I think. Um, the good game on BBC Basic, I think, that I got to was Elite. It's like a space game. You used to fly to different planets selling you whatever you had in your cargo holds and that. And uh, we used to play that at school. And then I got it from my an Amstrad CPC uh, disk drive 664, it was called. Um, and I got Elite for that. And it was coloured in planets and that, but it was really good. <laughs> yeah, that was a classic, because I used to have the old Amstrad CPC. They never made a Doctor Who game, but well, they had some brilliant games like Board of the Rings. It was a P-take of Lord of the Rings. And, and uh, oh, oh, there's the Cybermen again. And see, that that's what we did with that. We had uh, old PCs. I had the, obviously the Amstrad and... My sister had an Amstrad as well. She had the 6128, as was a bit better. Um, and, uh, oh, I used to have the Trivial Pursuit game. My dad used to play it with me. It was a Trivial Pursuit uh, disc. It was a little floppy, not not like a big floppy that they had back then, but like a little disc, but, oh, I can't really say the size it was, but that was good fun. Because Trivial Pursuit was the board game that the, you know was massive in the 80s, 90s, still about. But then it was on my disc and it'd do little songs and that and play bits of pictures and that. So it was really good for its time, you know. Obviously nothing now, but back then it was fascinating, brilliant stuff. So they've got the massive, if this is real fog, it's good. They've got the fog machine going, it gives it some atmosphere, doesn't it? So this is some sort of quarry, obviously a slate quarry or something. But this looks good. I like this. This is all good. This is the um, the fire, you know, the torch outside, and I like this. This all looks good to me. Um, I wish he'd lose this coat though, Trout, because he looks better in his sort of Charlie Chaplin outfit. He's got on underneath, you know, the usual. Because um, I think Trout was one of these actors. Once he was in the thing, he would be that you know like a clown so I mean he's not just a clown he's got the serious side but he goes oh here he comes Mr Davison probably spent a lot of his time here when he was filming uh, although it looks like the moors because oh, well, well, so he didn't see him no one sees anything that's right in front of him in this today I mean the TARDIS was right there and now the master's right there Susan doesn't know the master which is weird if she's a time lady, she should. Mm. I like it though. This oh, there's a, no, they don't see the side man even. He's right there. Oh, I think they cut this out of the uh, special edition, which was daft because it's brilliant. Tegan and Susan. Susan's weird. Looks got a fox face, doesn't she? Really, sort of. Cyber leader David Banks played it all the way through the eighties. Didn't know that at the time, but knew he was the leader because of the uh, black handle things. 
Mm. Yeah, the cyber lieutenant was the same as well, I think. The other guy. But, cyber men, yeah, they say they're supposed to be emotionless, but an emotionless enemy is really boring, isn't it? So it's got to show a bit of life, isn't it? Let's be honest. <laughs> The tissue compression eliminator, I like this, I thought this was a good device. I didn't know anything about the, uh, you know, the sexual thing. Here's the doorbell, or oh, sorry, the bike bell that he's got here. <laughs> but I think Anthony only, he had a private income of some kind, so he was allowed to, uh, all he wanted to do was play the master, apparently. So, come the Cybermen. There's no escape. Why is he, he looks this way. I mean, you can't miss the Cybermen, can you, really? God, there's... And the they were coming from one side. But they look good. This is good. It looks like they spent a few quid, didn't it? I think they got some funding from Australia for this, but... <laughs> there's Ainley having a panic attack. He's out. Peter Davison gets to go back to Gallifrey. Well, the Citadel, or Gall I mean, they're all Gallifrey, but... Gets to go back to the Citadel now, didn't he? <laughs> Zapped. Me like it, see, a bit of youthfulness, mm. and now he can disappear. They just they did something to this effect, I think, as well. Mm. Mustache, so cool, isn't it? Brilliant. <laughs> I like that. And red is out and disappears. I still think that's classic. Lots of Cybermen, though, they had lots of outfits that they probably had left over from Earthshop. Uh, apparently, they were bolted in. Oh, and there's a sprained ankle for the Terry Nation lovers out there. Oh dear. And Peter Davison appearing at BBC Centre. <laughs> mm. He's good. He is, you know, he's lost his thing, so now he's got to become a disciple of the Cybermen. Which is cool. I am your friend. I am your servant. <laughs> to show me I've got power of the Daleks, I'd like to have seen the uh, the, the first, second Doctor story. But they got a bandage on her quick, didn't they? Put her boot back on. I doubt the first Doctor's got to go, but they're going to leave um, Turlo and Susan in there. But Tegan's going to go with. The first Doctor, which is good. Mm. But it's quite good. I like this. This is fun. Yeah. They said, uh, someone said that uh, Turlo was going to end up being a foul, and I thought that would have been much better than what he ended up being, and Sigh on or whatever it was. Because uh, he looks like a foul, because he's got that sort of brush, the funny eyebrows and everything. And here's the Doctor on Gallifrey, returned. And uh, yeah, see, I mean, when we I was younger, the I mean, you could watch these things. You uh, and now they're a bit slow, obviously, because things have moved on. Pacing's got a lot quicker. Uh, editing's got quicker, but I can still see and watch this. You know, I don't watch it very much now, but like I do for this once in a blue moon, I pull it out. Got to be in the right mood for it. And it's good. It's happier. You know, I enjoy it. Uh, I didn't realise that Bruce, are, this is like the fourth actor to play Bruce, so he's burning through those regenerations. Lucky he's a Time Lord, eh? They could recast it every time. <coughs> Pardon me. But Angus Mackay was the original Bruce in The Deadly Assassin and by far the best. Uh, of course he popped up in Mordred Undead, so it's a shame they couldn't get him back for this because he would have done this quite well. But the Deadly Assassin, I mean, that's brilliant. I mean, that's an all-time classic Doctor Who. One of the top stories of the whole of the classic Who, really, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, Tom Baker's brilliant in that. I obviously came to Tom Baker. There was a friend of mine at uh, in grammar school, and uh, I said, because uh, you couldn't really get the tapes then. They'd released a few, but the videotapes hadn't really come out. So he said... Um, He'd got a lot of some, and I said, "Can you give me some Peter Davis?" And I like to see the fifth do five doctors again, and uh, I might have still had the five doctors on VHS. And 
I see, and he said, yeah, watch some of these Tom Baker ones. I said, no, oh, I don't like Tom, I never liked Tom Baker. I thought he was a rubbish. But he gave me a tape and it had um, the Ark in Space on it, which is classic. Um, yeah, Earthshock. The picture wasn't great because it was like a pirate, you know, loads of uh, degrees down, but had Earthshock on it. Uh, Deadly Assassin. That was the first tape he gave me of those three were on it because I gave him the tape. But he he put them all on long play for me. You know, that's what they used to have. These you could turn your video to long play and it would turn a four hour tape into an eight hour. I mean, the picture quality would go down, but you could have um, eight hours instead of four. So he put Ark in Space, uh, Earth Shock, and Deadly Assassin. And um, the Ark in Space is a complete classic, brilliant story. Um, Earthshock's a classic story, probably one of the best stories of the 80s by far. And uh, Deadly Assassin, which is one of the best stories of the 70s, and there's a lot of competition in the 70s. So, uh, But I remember sort of Tr Tristan, his, his name was Tristan, that's right. The guy, by I won't give you his other name in case you go look at it, uh, although... He was always forever going on about this book. He was going to write about birds having a revolt. I never heard it. It sounded good, but I never, it never came to fruition unless it's out there somewhere. He was going to write a book called Raven Rifle, something about ravens fighting against each other. It was like an animal farm with birds, I think. Um, but yeah, he got me back into it. So, and uh, Blake Seven, I think, as well, a bit. And uh, so, uh, I used to get like a pound every day for dinner money and uh, don't tell me mum and dad but I used to keep it and after two weeks I, I had, had a tenner and uh, I go to WH Smith and uh, yeah WH Smith or Woolworths because Woolworths was still about then and some of the old VHS's were exclusive to Woolworths and I what did I buy first I think Legopolis I got first so they put Logopolis out and then they put Robot out. So they put the last one out of Tom's out first, Tom Baker's first, and, they, and then they put Robot, the first story of Tom Baker's out. Um, I like Logopolis, I suppose. It was okay. Robot, yeah, it was all right. Uh, neither the greatest stories in the world, but... But didn't like the regen because I'd seen the Peter Davison regeneration from Tom Baker. The the Pertwee to Tom Baker was rubbish. You just but they need to sort that out. They need to do a new version of that because regeneration is a bit more special. You because even the first to second Doctor was a good one. So having the third to fourth was as the quick just change was rubbish. Really, they needed to do a better version of that. So anyway, yeah, and uh, that's what happened. I started, used to save, and then when I worked. I side work I got the rest used to buy one every couple of months they'd come out I think Terminus was a Woolworths exclusive one of the most boring stories of all time uh, and it was a shame because when you do get them all and you fill the blanks in from 1970 to 89 you'll buy them all but to be completist but there are so many duds I mean yeah, um, lots of Peter Davison ones. I mean, I like I like him in everything he does. I like him in all the part in all of the Doctors that he does. But when you watch some of them, they're so boring. I mean, Terminus is probably the Termin. I mean, yeah, it's crap. Um, what do I? So we start Cash Revelver, which I like. I like Cash Revelver because he's young and he's, he's the first one, and he's quite. Um, yeah, I like Cash Revelver. Forward to Doomsday is okay. Kinder, everyone raves, but no, it's boring to me, Kinder. Visitation's brilliant. We like the Visitation. That's a classic. Um, what's after Visitation? I think it's it's got to be Black Orchid. Well, no, I like Black Orchid, even though Peter Davison doesn't. I like Black Orchid. Uh, Earthshock, that's classic. Time flight, that's a complete load of rubbish. Crap, total crap. 
Uh, then we move to season 20, which is where this is at the end. Um, beginning of season 20. Arc Infinity. Uh, boring. Back to Gallifrey, but oh, they're not the mind probe. As a classic, he's just come out and been killed. Why doesn't he regenerate? I suppose these are guns that stop you from regenerating, are they? This could have been Colin Baker because he'd already played a Time Lord in um, Arc of Infinity before he took it. He'd have been better off playing it as the guard more than the way he played the Sixth Doctor. Because Maxil, the guard that Colin Baker played in Arc of Infinity, was much more arch, but would have been better playing it like that. Because I could believe that Peter Davison's Doctor would look at him and think maybe I could be him, you know, take his face on. Well, they have a common amount of faces on Gallifrey, so you pick one because there's only so many to choose from. But um, yeah, Colin Baker's Max Hill was better than his doctor by about 10 million percent. Um, what was I saying? Um, yeah, season 20. Well, Peter Davison himself says season 20 was his weakest. Uh, Snake Dance is boring. And Mordred Undead. I quite like Mordred Undead. I think that's a nice story. With the two Briggs and the Brig who doesn't recognise the Fifth Doctor, obviously, and that's all. That's a good. I mean, it's a bit of a crap ending, but it's a quite a good story. Terminus is one of the most boring stories of all time. Enlightenment is really good. I like Enlightenment with the, the flying ships and everything. That's classic. I like the King's Demons as well. I think that's a good story. It's only two episodes, and I like Chameleon. I know it's. Everyone moans about it and it's rubbish, but I thought it was alright. I like Chameleon and I like the story. I thought King. And then this follows, which is an absolute stunning classic. Uh, then we move into what? Warriors of the Deep. Uh, didn't like it. Uh, it's okay. I was disappointed because in the first episode, Peter Davison gets knocked in. Oh, he's a Yeti! There we go. Um, what well, is this? Some bog chain being pulled? Is the noise or something? But then. Didn't know what he was at the time, didn't scare me at all. The Yeti, thought it was quite funny. Liked him fizzing his, because this could be drought on, couldn't he, wearing that coat. <laughs> so he's got the, so he's a lot like the Fifth Doctor, he's got the cab bolt in his pocket and the junk. And I think the Yeti looks good. And now I finally seen the Web of Fear, that that goes right, I mean even the web, when you listen to the Web of Fear it's good. It's good as an audio and I listened to, I bought the CDs. And um, the audio of Web of Fear is good, but now I've actually seen the Web of Fear, even though one episode's still missing, is an absolute stunner. I mean, the enemy of the world's all right. They found the enemy of the world as well. But they raved about that, but it, it's okay, but it's a bit dull, you know. So, of the two, they found, I would have rather them found the evil of the Daleks. I'm gagging to see the evil of the Daleks and the power of the Daleks. Um the rest of that monster season which is the second Troughton season um, yeah but uh, um, I think they've got as much of Troughton as you need what's missing isn't all that wouldn't mind seeing the wheel in space it looked okay um, oh of course Fury from the Deep that's the other one we need to see if they could find that that'd be brilliant because this, this is a good little bit of set. This is actually on location, so they put this little door in there, and this looks good. It looks expensive. It looks like a proper feature film to me. I know people moan. When they're on, in the studio, yeah, you get to the old VHS-looking studio crappy look, but this is all good. Well, I don't know why they didn't uh, film everything on film. It would have been so much better, and I don't think it was that much dearer either. So. But here you see the contrast, you go into the studio and it's bright, it's white, but then I like this TARDIS, I like the TARDIS being white like this, I think this looks good. And here's the uh, cyber violin case, weird looking box thing, they're going to try and blow the TARDIS up, it takes them forever to set this up, and then the TARDIS gets out of the way, de dematerialises, but this is good, and they're standing still, but they're behind the rock, so the... The row, the rest, the rest of warrior robe. I can't see them anyway. So why are they staying stock still? They can move. They're behind a rock. But no. But this is good. We like this. I thought this was really cool at the time when I was a kid. The uh, and the way. And this is filmed by Nathan Turner apparently, the producer. 
I think this is brilliant. I mean, it didn't scare me as a kid. I just thought it was really good. I mean, they don't, there's no organic. You can't see any organic bit to the side, man. Though, can you? It looks like a robot, doesn't it? But brilliant. These discs and these arrows is brilliant. It really does. It, it, it's brilliant stuff. I love all this. This is probably the biggest exciting. I like the bit on the chessboard where they all get blown up. Uh, and the way it moves around, it still looks good. This dancer guy in his little sock jumping around is brilliant. I mean, yeah, the Cybermen look weakish, but they always look weak, Cybermen. They never have the great threat, do they? They're always defeated. But I think it's. And when it throws up, we see the milk, will we? Throw, there it is, yeah, they cut that bit short there. And spat the milk out, wherever it is. But I thought it was brilliant. Mm. Cyber Massacre. But this and Earthshock are the two. These are probably the best Cybermen stories, actually. Attack of the Cybermen's a load of rubbish. I'm talking about 80s Cybermen. Because I like Re I like Revenge of the Cybermen. I like the Five Doctors and I like uh, Earthshock. But Attack of the Cybermen really cheapens the memory of the Tomb of the Cybermen. Because the Tomb of the Cybermen looks brilliant. The massive tombs, it looks really good. But you stick a... You, then you make Attack of the Cybermen with Colin Baker and the tombs look totally different. They look crap. And it's a crap story, so yeah, it really cheapened it. It was horrible. And Silver Nemesis, well, forget that. That was a load of complete rubbish as well. So. Um, but here's Peter Davison talking to Councillor, whatever her name is, Chancellor Flavia or whatever. And there's a little war feature, but this is, I don't think this looks bad. This is 80s Gallifrey, obviously. But. I think it looks alright, but then I really like the war games, Gallifrey, because when they're on Gallifrey and the war games, when you see the colour photos of it, it looks really crap, but when it's black and white, it looks brilliant. This is like that, you know, there used to be a programme called Nightmare, that I used to watch as a kid, and it had all these kids, and there'd be a bloke where one of the kids would wear the helmet, and they'd have to guide um, him through dungeons, and they look like that to me, he looked like the fake sort of thing you have to get through why would they have a doorbell on Gallifrey it's not earth is it but this is still good um, yeah Nightmare was really good I used to like the Dragon Master where he was called uh, Dungeon Master where he was there that was great fun he's been on for years years <coughs> another part by you for like Chocky and all that we like Chocky and here he is, the action man, going across with the... Uh, see, this is quite well plotted. I mean, Terrence Dix, he plots these out well. I mean, this is really good. I mean, Robert Holmes did a thing, version of this, and it would have been so much crapper. This is much better. I think Terrence Dix was a brilliant story. I mean, even though he was sort of sexist, misogynist, I suppose. Well, Terrence Dix, I mean, robot, he wrote that, and that's all right. Uh, what else did Terrence Dix write? He wrote the War Games with Malcolm Hunt, which was classic. Um, yeah, let's see, uh, State of Decay, which I like. Horror Fan Rock, which is classic. Um, Brain and Morbius, which is great. It is a great story, but never no, one of my favourites. I don't know what it is. Slow for me, Brain and Morbius. So not mad keen. Uh, but yeah, Terence Dix. I think this was the only thing Terence Dix wrote in the eighties. I mean, he was a script editor through the whole Pertwee era, so he um, did a good job. Even though I suppose he was overworked, and a lot of the, I mean, Pertwee for every good, there's a bad. Uh, um, I like. Uh, in Pertwee's era I suppose he's bit I mean Inferno it's a good story yeah but it's too long so that first I like Spirit from Space but he's not in it much so and as a first story it can't be classic here we are as a chess ball be like this how does he know that this is all wired wrong why, why wasn't the floor he's already standing on be watch and why would you warn anyone I know it's a kids but this is a bit nightmare as well whatever it's called you know, like Dungeon Master we'll help you through <laughs> using the coins and this is all about pi I mean I was fascinated with the pi thing at the time but of course it makes no sense because 
the master dances across it in a bit. Here we go with the old BBC Basic graphics. Much better than the revamped version. They can keep the revamped version. This is much better. Uh, the master sort of strides across the dock. There's no real pattern to what they're doing. So it doesn't make any sense. But I like it. It's a nice. This is like Death to the Daleks, which had a similar sort of puzzle thing. But whereas Death to the Daleks was pretty dull and boring. This is classic. This all works beautifully. Uh, Death to the Dikes being in Pervis last year, which everyone sort of likes, but I find really boring. I think my favourite Pervy Dalek story is um, Day of the Daleks. And they're not in it that much, and they weren't supposed to be, but I think their suit's better that they're in the background manipulating it. And it's like a Terminator type storyline where they're changing the time loop and that, and I think that's really good. It's my fa one of my favourite Pervy stories, Day of the Daleks. I think I, when I used to go to Blockbusters, when they had videos, they'd have a few Doctor Who's there, they'd have uh, Revenge of the Cybermen, uh, Planet of Spiders, uh, where's they have, uh, I think they had Ark in Space, um, um, Death to the Daleks, Day of the Daleks, and I picked the wrong one up. I picked up Death to the Daleks, and I was really disappointed when I got it home and put it on because it's so boring. Whereas Day of the Daleks is much more fun, better story, much better. Like I say, for every good Pertwee, there's a rubbish Pertwee. Jeffrey Bailden, oh, they were going to have him as the first Doctor, were they? I didn't realise he was uh, gay until, um, I think he's just died, but whatever. Good actor, as good. he was in Doctor Who, but he was in uh, The Creature from the Pit, which, yeah, they say it's, uh, it's crap, it's rubbish, yeah. The Creature from the, creature from the Pit, I can't watch it, it's boring. There's nothing exciting happens in it. In Tom Baker's law, that pulp penultimate year, you've got City of Death, which is a total classic. Destiny of the Daleks, which is alright. Creature from the Pit, which is crap. Nightmare on Eden's alright. Horns of Nyman's dull as buggery, boring. Uh, so, yeah, and Sharda from what I, because I, I raced out when Sharda came out and Tom Baker did the links and you got the script book with it. And, yeah, Sharda, I'd have rather they'd kept Sharda and got rid of the Creature from the Pit and horns of Nyman, they could have lost both of them and done Sharder as far as I'm concerned. It would have been a lot better. Uh, and of course, that was the last one where Tom looks like he's enjoying himself. Because as soon as the Leisure Hive comes along, it's downhill for Tom there, isn't it? Although the Leisure Hive is a boring story, there's some funny bits in it. Arrest the Scar. There you go, his last action role. He died in 84, at the age of 73. Uh, can't really say it was a good. I think he was in a Stepto and Son, any old iron. Fancy Harold, I think. That I saw him in that. He was sort of dressed like the third Doctor in that. So if you want, if you find any old iron or whatever it's called, um, put that on and see if he he looks like the third Doctor. He's all dandified. He was in Blake Seven in what was that one called? Um, Assassin, yeah, which. People moan about the last season of Blake 7, but I think it's one of the best seasons because I love Paul Darrow's Avon in that season. He's brilliant. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he, he was wearing a nappy and he plays a sort of slave bloke. Um, oh, here she comes. Tegan's got to come across looking lovely. She cut her hair because she didn't like the amount of colour and all that they stuck in it. See, why would the president go into his secret room? Because he's obviously the baddie. You know, spoilers. Her. Uh, but um, why would the president disappear now? Does he want to get caught? See, Peter Davis is going to play the harp, type, which I quite like. I like that. That's all fine. It looks like they've spent money on this. I don't think it looks bad at all. Uh, they must have had those Galifrey and Guard outfits from all the way back to the Deadly Assassin. They're probably even wearing the same... Um, Time Lord gear that 
the top of Lord's Bear. So this is definitely the Gallifrey setup in Ark of Infinity. This is the same guy. And there's the tune and Rassilon sitting there and the harp of Rassilon and yeah, it's good. But I think you see the rope there. I think um, the um, I think um, Pertwee and Sarah Jane would get stuck in it, like, <laughs> which I think is funny. <laughs> oh, this is the drill. Oh, this is the cameo time. Here we go. It's cameo time. Sarah Jane's look at that horrible. Why has she got gloves like a child? She wore the Andy Pandy outfit, and now she's got gloves with bloody string. <sighs> and Pertwee wearing his sort of tartan mother hen cloak thing. He'd look better without the cloak, to be honest. He'd best off taking it off. With his red velvet, that looks a lot better. Capaldi's taken on a bit of that. But here we go. Who's, who are we going to see? Didn't know who either of these people were until they turned up. Mike Yates. Obviously went back when later on to look at these, but... He looks pretty similar to how he did in the 70s. Um, and Liz Shaw, who looks totally different. She only did the one year because she wasn't the Dolly Bird the uh, sexist 70s crew wanted. But she's a good actress as well. Um, I can't remember her name off the top of my head now. But Caroline John. Uh, she was married to Geoffrey Beavers, who played the master and keeper of Traken. Yeah. I like this though, this is cool. We I mean, probably looks good enough and they I mean she's older but she looks fine. Mike Yates looks fine. Another classic Perry the demons and things like that. I like it though, it is good. And she's scary, she it sounds scary when she says that. I remember being nervous at the time when she did that. I thought it was quite good. Uh, Sarah Jane's all sort of red hair. Apparently, she was a. I mean, she is a good actress, but I don't. Because Barry Lett said, "Oh, she could have been a great star," but I don't think so. Um, she's a. She, yeah, I think he groped her up then, didn't he, Pertwee? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the former companions, Victoria and Zoe. I don't think Hartnell would have seen anyone. Mm. Or Herndall, the first Doctor, because he's... It's good, though, isn't it? I mean, the way that Terence Dix has bung this together. But yeah, I just remember at the time thinking this was so good. It was by far my favourite story when I was younger, and it's still great. It's still one of my all-time favourites. You can't beat the five Doctors, really. It's brilliant. Uh, I showed this to my, my son. Watch this. He's grown up now, but when I was he was young, I make you know I make him all watch it because I'm just that kind of guy. <laughs> my daughters watched it and they enjoyed it as well. Uh, this is one that I think the family can still watch. It's fast paced enough, slightly slow, but it's enough because I think that like it, Peter Davison says they should edit. I mean, we know we like all the episodes together, but really they should edit them together now and shorten them. Uh, all the classic stories they should have an edit on their discs here they are Zoe and Jamie Jamie see look uh, Fraser Hines looks really good doesn't he I mean this is 14 years after he finished and he looks fine and even Zoe there she looks I mean always quite fancy Zoe especially in Mind Rob when she's sitting on the console with her I don't know why she's got bubble wrap on she doesn't really need that to take that off she looks sexy as hell I, I like a bit of Wendy Pabry back then definitely fancy a bit of that <laughs> um, she was a lovely little companion from the 60s and this is the problem here oh this is why they, they recognise the Brigadier because they, they were left with the memory of their first adventure with the Doctor when they were their memories were wiped and they were left with their first memory of their adventures of him with the doctor so they wouldn't recognize the brigadier but yeah lovely and i like the scream it's really good <laughs> see it's great it is uh, it's brilliant <clears throat> yeah and of course the second doctor if he's a temporal anomaly he's been picked up it's at the end of his time he's been taken right at the end of his time 
and then in yeah, in the two doctors later on, which was a I quite like the two dogs, but still massive disappointment. Poor, I mean, that's probably one of the best Colin Baker stories, the two doctors, and they don't say a lot, to be honest. And here's Peter Davison again, sorting it out. He's going to get in there, he's going to work it out. He's got the harp, he's got the tune. The harp of Rassilon. Got a bit of eyeliner on there, Pete, hasn't he? Let's uh, thank God that now makeup has become minimal and they don't have to wear all this sort of makeup it's something to do with the lighting apparently but but yeah of all the fancy book um yeah zoe i fancied didn't really care about victoria uh fancied the other bird who was in the invasion she was nice uh, she was only in that story but she, isabel whatever her name was um liz sure no katie manning is yeah, all right sarah jane all right Romana one, lovely, very sexy, uh, Leela, no. Tegan, yeah, never liked Lala Ward much, nice lady, but didn't do anything for me. Sarah Sanders, Nissa, very nice, Perry, oh yes, probably my favourite, uh, sexy companion of the classic era, really, she was lovely. Tegan, but then look, Tegan looking good there with her short skirt, with he, <laughs> There's the misogynist and sexist in me coming to the surface. And there they are, that these two doctors were alike, I suppose, both sort of curmudgeonly, sort of miserable. But Troughton finally gets rid of that stupid coat, and there's the original Troughton look. Very good. Shame he couldn't get the air right, really, wouldn't it? It looks better, but it needs lifting, whatever it was they used to lift it. But I think Drought will have blackface and all that and originally, so thank God that didn't happen. Because I think Hartnell was a racist anyway. But a product of his time, wasn't he? Which was unenlightened days. And of course, Perby spent most of his time with the Brig. Mm. Uh, stuck on Earth, which was alright. Most of the unit stories are quite good. I uh, really like the demons, that's one of the classics. Um, Day of the Daleks. Um, yeah, because when Pertwee left Earth, they were a bit rubbish. Uh, I like the Claws of Axos, that's, I suppose that's a unit story. Claws of Axos, they came to Earth. I like the the Green Death's quite good. Um, Planet of the Daleks is quite good. Frontier in Space doesn't go anywhere, so it's a bit boring. Even though the baddies are quite good in that. Um, the Peladon stories, yeah, the first one's all right, but still dull. The Monster Peladon's crap. Invasion of the Dinosaurs is really good. I like that. Here they are. They're explaining how about getting them immortality with this strange role. I wonder who designed this because they did quite a good job of this. It looks quite well, doesn't it? See, look. I mean, even though both second and third doctors left the role a long time ago they still look really good they still look like the doctors basically that they played which i think is brilliant really um, i mean Perry's is a lot whiter but he's still got the bloody granny do the perman set and there's the master with his penguin suit which is cool I mean, Anthony Ailey never had good scripts. This might be one of his... But, but um, I think they should have finished him off in Planet of Fire. I mean, Survivor was all right. Mark of the Rani didn't need him in it. Trial of a Time Lord. That was all right. I liked his black TARDIS. They sprayed it all black. That looked cool. And here we go. The Brig's going to lay him out. Hey! <laughs> Boom, there we go, lovely jubbly. See, I loved all this when I was a kid, brilliant. I think I watched this from start to finish back then. Mm, it was classic, just a total classic. Oh, uh, big, isn't it? They're going to blow up. I think you can see little bits of his blonde hair. I think he worked with Steve Irwin, Mark Strickson, who plays Turlow here. He went to Australia and did the old documentaries and... and uh, came back he does the uh, big finish audios but if it's not on telly for me it's no good 
I mean, I listen to the telly versions of, um, you know, the uh, ones that are lost, but when they make the new ones, I don't like them. I think they're stupid. He's playing the tune. They changed this tune for the revamp. God knows why. Um, but it's fine. And I like this. This is quite good, you know, going into the room, finding the time scoop and all that. It's really good. And there's the, uh, I'd look, you know, this must be worth a fortune, this lot. If you had any of this, you got some big money, ain't you? <laughs> I wonder who kept it, or if anyone kept it. It's just brilliant. I mean, he looks a bit, now you can see him in this high def. They look a bit cheap and crap. They've been thrown together. But this is all good. And here he is. What, uh, he's had to wear the black outfit, of course. Now he's become the bad guy. Inside our intelligence by dressing him up in black. Why he would shake his hands, I've no idea. But Especially not Peter Davison. Peter Davison would never be a bad doctor. He's always so straight. But it's just something so likeable about Peter Davison in this part. In most of the stuff he does. Just a really likable guy. Um, I think uh, I went to. He was at Wankham. Uh, I think, although probably wise, he's quite weary of fan fandom. I think, which is fair enough because there are some nutters out there. I suppose you could class me as a nutty fan, couldn't you? Really, but I'd like to. I'd like to know him in life because I've, I've, I've seen Tom Baker and he's always performing Tom and. Although an interesting guy, he's completely crazy. Um, but Peter just seems like a nice, normal guy. But Colin Baker was a lovely man, but I hate his doctor's rubbish. It's just, but in real life, Colin Baker was lovely. He was, he let me wear his multicoloured coat. Uh, Sylvester McCoy is a nice guy as well, but didn't like their doctors. Mm. Yeah, they're gonna. He's going for immortality, isn't he? Oh, Bruce. Although, why he didn't just beam himself straight to the thing? No, they are. Let's see, they've all got something to do, and we're going to reverse the polarity, even though he didn't say it. Um, that many times. I think I only said it once in the Pertwee year. He says it here somewhere, doesn't he? Um, and here we go with the old transistor radio. I mean, this is all quite good, but took forever to blow and he's gone nice little um, mini cliffhanger thing that's fine isn't it yeah. uh, Douglas Canfield was offered to do it he would have been better at directing this I think Boris I saying whatever his name is directed the first two but the first story um, an unearthly child is the first episode's good, but then the crappy stuff are going back to caveman times, boring as hell, and uh, really dull. A lot of first Doctor stuff dull. I like the Dalek invasion of Earth. The Aztecs is all right. Keys of Marinus is boring. It's all right. Um, I like the Time Meddler actually. I think that's a good story. I suppose Peter Barworth in that is um, the prototype sort of meddling monkeys like the second doctor actually the same hair the same sort of mischievousness but yes it's good and, and I've, this is he's the be, he's the second best Barusa this one because um, in Invasion of Time he's he's alright but he's a bit dull yeah um, and the Invasion of Time is again a pretty crap story with the horrible cheap walking around in a big uh, hospital thing with all the bricks and that to be the inside of the TARDIS oh here we go he's going to resist but he can't resist because he's wearing that crown that emphasises his brain power <laughs> which is cool I like that I think that's good you know, he's got control of the fifth doctor Um. Which is good again, and here's the tar diesel. <laughs> the prop that was forever. It took me forever to see the T's in the window as well, you know, stupid bloke that I am. Because it makes out the T, didn't it? And I never noticed it. What a dummy. Here they go. 
<laughs> they couldn't get Katie Manning in because she was in Australia at the time. But apparently there there might have been some kind of um, affair with Katie Manning and John Pertwee. I can't imagine how and why, but um, um, Katie Manning was um, yeah far too attractive to go with Pertwee. He's an older man, a lot older, in his fifties at that point. So. Fraser Irons couldn't do it because he couldn't permanently come with the second doctor because he was in Emmerdale Farm at the time, which is a boring soap in England that no one wants to watch. Well, millions of people watch it, but it's boring as all. Yeah, there we are. See, the three doctors interacting, which is nice. I like this. Apparently they were kept apart because of the egos involved, they thought, but then the, Peter Davison said there weren't any egos and it would have been fine, but... Mm. This is all good. Oh, it's a lovely ending. It's, oh, and he's controlling them all. Even though the brig moves his head, he's supposed to stay still, but he still moves his head there because he's watching him. The brig's got the will to turn his head. <laughs> but that who cares? It's quite good. Mm. Tom Baker, I didn't think would ever. I mean, Peter Davison says this, but he was never coming back, was he? Uh, Tom Baker, I mean, he came back for the day of the Doctor, but that was only at the end, and which I don't mind because his, that was quite good. Where he popped up and spoke to Max Smith for five minutes, which was nice. Uh, the combined will of the Doctors, they can fight him now. This is good. We like this. Mind lock. <laughs> this is good. Yeah, we like it. They're all, it's, it's just brilliant when I was a lad. I was just fascinated by the regenerations and all the different versions of the Doctor and all the Gallifrey stuff, the TARDIS. This is brilliant. And I think uh, this is the last time... Oh, no, actually, Warriors of the Deep. It's probably the last time Peter Davison wears this exact outfit because in the Awakening the jumper's got more V and the coat is lighter, creamier, which I think is better. I prefer that. I like the outfit he's got now, but I, I like the lighter, creamier version of it. And I prefer the double. And Peter Davison's way of acting in the third season is like he's taking a drug or something. He's like much more switched on, he's much more sort of angry and it's really good. Um, yeah, in, in Warriors of the Deep he's, he's good throughout. I like Peter Davison's Doctor but in case of Andrew Zani, he's brilliant. I mean he's really good. I mean no, I don't think any other actor had played the Doctor as well as that. Before or after, I think that's brilliant. And he was, in Planet of Fire he's really good. It's like he's changed gears or something. Um, he's got a really so. I mean, Frontios is boring, but he's really good in that as well. It's like and the Awakening, and even Resurrection of the Daleks, which isn't very good, but he really does. He plays it with some kind of. It's like anger or aggression, something, which is different from the first two seasons. He's softer in the first two seasons, and in the third season, he's really sort of strong it's just stronger it's weird hard to describe it's like he's took some pill or something that's yeah <laughs> and here's Rassilon who's appeared many many times now but we like him I like this version of Rassilon I thought this was very good didn't realise it was him laying on that thing for a while the tomb but of course this is all a trap and these, uh, this scared me a bit these um, things in the the thing underneath the tomb and they'll come to life in a minute because it looks like they've got soap all over their faces and red stuff in their eyes like they've been poked in the eye or something you watch them in a minute and they're all like these white pasty things in that tomb thing and yeah it's brilliant there they go uh, this is really good I like this it's scary eerie for kids looks like they're trapped they, they look terrified didn't they it's really good I think that's really good uh, and they're all trapped by Brusa, not Brusa, Rassilon, and yeah, classic. The ring goes back and the trap is reset. I think it's brilliant. 
And there he is. I wonder if that was him. Is that? Did they put him in there? Do you reckon? <laughs> and now they all sort of mad laugh, and then they all turn back to stone, which is classic. And here we are reaching the end. And I like the way he talks. He talks a bit like weird, like a Romanian or something. I don't know what kind of accent that is. He too will be freed. And Tom Baker in a minute, you'll see later. Which I thought was quite funny, especially... I quite like the scarf getting stuck in the TARDIS door. I thought that was funny as well at the time. There he is, cling... And he looks so happy and he's with Lala, who he married and they're having happy days and... Look, there's the wrong thing on the TARDIS. The lights are wrong. I don't care. It's brilliant. Joyous. Bye-bye, Master. We'll see you again in Planet of Fire, where you burn up. And you watch Peter Davison in that. He's steely in that. Planet of Fire is pretty dull, but he's really good in that. Although, I don't mind Planet of Fire. It's just two, like, desert planets in a row, really. Planet of Fire straight to caves. And of course we get Perry in her bikini, which is sexy, sexy, sexy. Because Perry, I met her at a convention when I was thinner and prettier, and she sort of gave me a look, and I thought, oh yeah, because she was still sexy then. There we go, the, the denouement. Well, they've worked it out, and uh, they're going to part, and uh, Peter Davison is going to be made. President of Time Lords again, as Tom Baker was. Although I think Tom Baker was still president when he left Gallifrey. Yeah, I'm not sure, but yeah, yeah there he is. John Purby, oh, I like, yeah, yeah, he's still good. I mean, he's, he's a presence, they all are, aren't they? There's a great presence. And now he's off. The first doctor, it's sad, really. It was, you'd like to have seen more, I would like to have seen more of this. Doctors together, but no. <laughs> and then the Brigadier's going off with uh, Troughton. The fancy pants and Scarecrow stuff. Even though, of course, Pert, we should have been the Scarecrow, shouldn't he? Really, has he played Virgil Gummidge? <laughs> Classic days. And we like the Brig. Brig's always good. Mm. Yes, yeah, great. But we've come. To, but like I say, this is wonderful. And I had a coat, and I used to walk around and affect the mannerisms of Peter Davison. See John Purvey's jealousy there. Of uh, I'm sure his jealousy of sharing it with Peter Davison, because he, he looks like you know. I wish I'd have stayed. Because I bet he would have stayed if he could have. But Peter Davison, he just stands. He does. He, he's as big as Purvey, isn't he? And he does stand his ground. I think. And he's a better actor than Bert, we've definitely. Mm. And, all the time, and they change this for the special edition and all, but I, I don't mind this. I love this, but they will disappear off in different directions. This is cool. Mm. Yeah, I, I take this and then I take the four because I, because you didn't have as many tapes back then, so I video VHSs. So it got taped over, then I taped it again because you get bored of it. And then I taped it again, and here we go, where he's given the presidency again. And this is good, because this is um, Terence Dix giving us the uh, circle, completing the circle now, because he's going to run away again. That's how it all started, which I think is really good. But I've really enjoyed this. I've, uh, you know, I've watched it once every couple of years, probably, because, I mean, I did it to death when I was young. I watched it all the time, and... Used to play in the playground, pretend to be the fifth doctor, and brilliant fun because he's so breathless, isn't he? He's such a sort of flying around and running up and down, and we love it. And now he's the president again, and of course, he will lose the presidency when he returns to Gallifrey when he's the sixth doctor for the trial of Time Lord, <laughs> which is a load of rubbish as well, pretty much. With Colin Baker with the massivest hair you'll ever see, and the horriblest outfit you'll ever see, and yeah, I see. Brilliant style. I mean, Peter Davison's really good. They're off in the TARDIS. Yep, they're all off in the TARDIS. <laughs> and now she's being escorted back by the guards, and he will, dr and he's disappearing. And it's the end 
I've had a really good time and there's uh, Sexy Tegan and uh, Mark Strickson wearing his ruddy schoolboy outfit even though he's about 29 I think <laughs> I don't know how old he was but he looks a lot older than a schoolboy doesn't he uh, I think Peter Davison's got sort of Star Trek sideburns there and he's got the sort of triangle just sort of triangular uh, but they all said Peter Davison was a great leading man I reckon he would have been more of a team and there he is we're all done well that was fun um, it was a great trip and there it is the end it's been fun peeps I hope you listen I hope you enjoy tell me what you think and tell me what I should do next but I'm going to go for my odyssey of childhood films and that and what I grew up in this is one of my childhood sort of great things that I loved so yeah, signing off. Enjoy your evenings and whatever. See you, or whatever this is you listen to. See you later on. Bye. Oh,